Hello, my name is Dylan. Today, we're going to talk about Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is located in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, in Washington State. Today, the landscape around Mount St. Helens has been drastically altered by an eruption that occurred here on May 18, 1980. Today, Mount St. Helens looks like this. Before the eruption, it looked like this. To tell you more about this drastic change is my friend, Gina. Hello, my name is Gina and I work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. I'm here in front of the landscape on the north side of Mount St. Helens and I'm here to tell you a story about what happened when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. The landscape behind me is dramatic and it gives evidence to the power that volcanoes have to shape the landscape both building up and breaking down the land. Before this big eruption in 1980, there were many people with different relationship to this mountain and this space. Some communities of people, such as the Cowlitz Indian tribe, confederated tribes of the Yakima Nation, lived by this volcano and witnessed Mount St. Helens erupting for many thousands of years. These communities of people have names for the mountain that reflect the fact the Mount St. Helens erupted many times over the course of its history. Names such as the smoking one and water steam that comes out. For people who came to settle, they did not think of Mount St. Helens as a volcano, but instead as a mountain. It was a place for recreation, for swimming, for snowshoeing and climbing. About two months before the large explosive eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, an earthquake was detected by a team of scientists in Seattle. During this time, there was not much equipment on these volcanoes to monitor things like earthquakes. And so scientists came down and put more pieces of equipment on Mount St. Helens and began detecting many more earthquakes. The earthquake started out low and deeper down inside the volcano and then moved towards the surface. In the month preceding the eruption, there were over 10,000 earthquakes here. Another sign that the volcano was waking up was the change in the shape of the mountain. This change occurred on the north side of the volcano, the side of the mountain that's behind me in this frame. As magma pushed up and caused many of these earthquakes, it changed the shape of the mountain pushing out or ballooning out the north flank. This shape change was so dramatic that the side of Mount St. Helens grew outward at a rate of five feet a day for an entire month the volcano changed its shape. Scientists came to monitor the shape change. This was a time before there were such things as remote cameras. So people needed to be here right where I'm sitting to use reflectors and actually measure the change in shape of the mountain. On the morning of May 18, 1980, the sun was shining and it was a quiet morning. The earthquakes had ceased. The north flank of the mountain, which had become so swollen and so unstable, collapsed in a massive landslide. The landslide covered the area on the north side of the mountain with the former summit and north flank of the volcano, coating this landscape, which originally was covered in forest, with rock and debris. As the side of the mountain came off in this massive landslide, it unleashed all of the magma that was under pressure inside the volcano. This magma blasted outwards in a massive explosion, in a sideways or lateral blast. This blast traveled at hundreds of miles an hour across the landscape, knocking down the forest and burying the landscape with feet, to inches of pieces of volcanic rock and material from the volcano. After the blast swept across the landscape, knocking down forests as far as 17 miles away, ash and magma exploded up and out of the volcano in a large ash column. This ash rose many thousands of feet into the air and created a column that was so high it was visible from cities such as Portland and Seattle. The ash was carried by the prevailing winds and blown over to the east, where it coated homes and towns and communities in eastern Washington with fine particles of volcanic rock. 
Some of that ash blew across the United States, and eventually, in two weeks' time, some fine particles of ash traveled all the way back here to Mount St. Helens. Along with the ash erupting up vertically from the volcano, some of the magma and ash exploded outwards down the flanks of the mountain. We call these pyroclastic flows, pyro meaning hot fire and clast meaning pieces of rock. These clouds of hot ash tumbled down the sides of the mountain, coating the landscape. We can see some of the evidence from these pyroclastic flows in the smooth flanks of the north side of Mount St. Helens. What was there previously was a forest buried by the landslide and then buried by a layer of cloud of flowing ash, which formed a smooth surface on the north flank. One of the longest lasting effects of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens were massive debris flows that carried ash and volcanic debris, mud and sand down the river valleys. These occurred because the mountain in May of 1980 was covered with snow and ice. And during this hot eruption and big explosion, the snow and ice melted and began moving swiftly down the river valleys, carrying all of the material that swept up in its path. Lahar is an Indonesian term for a volcanic mud flow. And these flows were hot, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and they carried so much material they had the consistency of moving concrete. There was so much snow and ice that melted, it carried this material down the river valleys many tens of miles away from Mount St. Helens. And these flows lasted for over 12 hours after the eruption. There are many stories of the May 18, 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Yet this is not the end of the mountain's tale. We hope that these stories inspire you to visit and create some stories of your own. My name is Gina and I work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. Thanks for joining me today.